Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. Jasper T. Scott. His box set, Dark Space, the complete series. This is six books bundled together on sale now for 99 cents. Six complete books, over 600,000 copies sold. More than 2,000 pages of epic space opera for the low price of 99 cents. Also available in Kindle Unlimited if you're a Kindle Unlimited subscriber. Humanity is defeated. Ten years ago, the Scythians invaded the galaxy with one goal, to wipe out the human race. Now the survivors are hiding in the last human sector of the galaxy, dark space. Once a place of exile for criminals, now the last refuge of mankind. The once galaxy-spanning Imperium of Star Systems is left guarding the gate, which is the only way in or out of dark space. But not everyone is satisfied with their governance. Freelancer and ex-convict Ethan Ortain is on the run. He owes crime lord Alec Barandi 10,000 souls, and his ship is badly damaged. When Brandi catches up with him, he makes an offer Ethan can't refuse. Ethan must infiltrate and sabotage the Valiant, the Imperial Star System's fleet carrier which stands guarding the entrance of dark space, and then his debt will be cleared. While Ethan is still undecided about what he'll do, he realizes that the Imperium has been lying and putting all of Dark Space at risk. Now Brondi's plan is starting to look like a necessary evil, but before Ethan can act on it, he discovers that the real plan was much more sinister than what he was told, and he will be lucky to escape the Valiant alive. Grab all six books for 99 cents right now. Dark Space, the complete series by Jasper T. Scott. The Unwelcome Trilogy by R.D. Brady, Survivor, Mother, Leader, and Humanity's Last Chance. Deep within the remnants of the United States, Lila Richards oversees a camp of 200 survivors. In a world where living is an everyday struggle, and only through banding together can people survive, the arrival of the Unwelcome only made her job harder. Riley Quinn and Miles Jones have been raised by Lila for the last five years. They're also one of the cursed, the children between the ages of 13 and 18, whom the unwelcome kill on sight. No questions, no pleas, just death. Protecting one another and the people of their camp is ingrained in all of them, but now each of them faces increased danger as the reason why the cursed have been targeted by the unwelcome slowly comes to light, and that truth will shock them to their core. Now time is running out, not just for the cursed who are being hunted down by the unwelcome, not just for Lila and her family who will face the greatest challenge yet, but for all of humanity. The world changed radically 35 years ago, but today humanity's very existence is on the line, and the fight has begun that will ensure its future or its annihilation. Fans of A.G. Riddle, James Rollins, Suzanne Collins, and Brandon Sanderson will love the Unwelcome Trilogy. Pick up your copy of the Unwelcome Trilogy on Amazon today. Edge of Valor, a military sci-fi thriller by Josh Hayes. When their mission fails, his begins. David Weber calls it a tour de force. Special Agent Jackson Fisher is a man after truth. When a military operation to extract a high-ranking ambassador from the war-torn border world of Stonemeyer ends in disaster, Fisher is called in to investigate. A whole platoon went in, but only three Alliance Marines returned home. The rest killed in action along with hundreds of civilians. With tensions between the Holloman Alliance and Stonemeyer rising, Fisher attempts to stitch the pieces together. One thing becomes more and more certain. The surviving Marines are lying. As the truth unfurls, Fisher begins to realize this was far more than a simple rescue mission and that the truth might be something best left buried. Filled with action, mystery, and well-crafted characters, Edge of Valor... The Valor series book one will put you into a world of war, conspiracy, and betrayal. It's perfect for fans of David Weber's Honorverse or Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan with a futuristic flair. 
That's Edge of Valor by Josh Hayes. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Sheila Roberts on the show with me today. She has a fantastic new book. It's called Christmas from the Heart, and when we're recording this, it's been out for about a week now, I think, and uh, already doing amazing things. Uh, Welcome to the show, Sheila. Thank you so much for having me. I'm always excited to talk about books. Absolutely. Me too. Um, the Sheila, before we get into talking about all the fun stuff we're going to, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, my goodness. You know, I, I remember reading somewhere once that often the things you do as a child are a reflection of what you'll be doing when you're an adult. And I was writing little stories when I was in grade school. I was making my own little books and binding them with hard paper. And I really felt sorry for, I can't I think I might have been my fourth grade class. They were like a captive audience because what's the latest story she has written? Oh, come up and read it to the class and drive them crazy. <laughs> so I'm, I think I'm kind of not your normal, your norm, well, the, not that there's any such thing as a norm, but I mean, writers have a, a reputation for being a little bit introverted, and I'm like the opposite. I'm like, where is the spotlight? I have been trying to get on Dancing with the Stars for years, <laughs> but oh, oh well, there you have it. That's so funny. You know, writers do have a reputation for being kind of hermits and introverts, but, you know, I've done nearly 750 of these uh, podcasts, and, you know, I just don't wow. find that. I don't find that to be the norm. Um, and not that there is a norm, but yeah, I I think a lot of writers are just as personable as, as everyone else. We just happen to have jobs that put us in a room by ourselves for most of the time. Well, that's true. And the beauty of it then is you can get out to events and meet readers and have phone conversations like this, and which is a good thing. A lot of my friends actually are introverts, and some of them, they would just rather have, you know, hot nails drilled under their fingernails <laughs> and <laughs> have to, like, go do a book signing. And I'm like, I right. love a book signing. You know, so it, it, I guess it, it just it just varies, and yeah. that's what makes life so interesting. We're exactly. also different, and we all have a different story to tell and a different slant. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So um, did did you ever have an adult in your life, maybe a parent or a teacher, that recognized this gift in you? Oh, my goodness. You know, I did, and it circles back to that one teacher in grade school. My, my uh, maiden name was Moyle, and I remember one year she, for Halloween, she dressed up like a little gypsy, and she wrote up fortunes for every kid saying something positive. I mean, you know, class of 25 or 30, so I don't know how many kids she had in this class, but she did this, and I still to this day remember mine. It said, so you're reading Moyle in school, my son? I knew her well when she was young, and I saved that. I mean, that just embedded itself in my brain. It was such a cool thing, and I, I wish I'd been able to find her once I was a grown-up because I would love to have tracked her down, given her a book, and said, look at, look at you know, what you fostered. So, boy, I tell you what, teachers can have a very powerful influence in our life. As can any adult, you know, and parents. And I always think as parents, it's really important to kind of see what things your child is, is gravitating toward. You know, are, are they good with their hands? Are they creative? Do they want to sing and dance? And try and, and nurture that and let them get training in that so they can feel good about themselves and maybe even have something to pursue when they're grown up. Right. And, it you know, it's, it's such a um... – It's such a simple thing to encourage a child, and that's why I love to ask that question because I want to remind people that when you see a a kid around you to offer that little bit of encouragement, you just never know 20 years from now what that little piece of encouragement is going to bring to the rest of us in the world. And it's it's just such a a simple, easy thing. But, you know, a lot of people have those stories of, of, you know, because writing can be a lonely thing. Uh, thing and there's some dark days when you know it just doesn't seem fun and you know it's hard work and and you have those little things to pull back on and uh, I love that story from you. Well, I just think it's really cool and I'm assuming that there probably was an adult in your life doing the same thing for you. Oh, somewhere. oh yes, I had I had uh, I had an English teacher that I had in the ninth and eleventh grade, and she she definitely saw that and she would slip me books. 
that, uh, and then, you know, she would oh. hand it to me and then go, oh, I don't know if you're ready for this yet or not. And, you know, and I'd be like, oh, I've got to have this book, you know, and it was just, uh, and uh, Mrs. Harper was her name. She was just absolutely oh, fantastic. So cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so as you got older, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of us have those early dreams and then life tends to steer us in different directions and, uh, and you know our our route to becoming a writer is circuitous sometimes. Uh, how about you? Did did you immediately go to writing, or were there other things in your life that that steered you around? Well, I tell you, isn't that the truth? I well, you know, I was always dabbling in writing, and and the first things I think I had published were a couple of little magazine articles for small magazines. But what I really wanted to do was be a songwriter. I just you know, but that batted my head on the cement wall trying to make that happen. And, you know, people talk about writing being tough. Well, the music business is about 10 times tougher. It's, it's just a killer. And I spent a fortune in trips to Nashville and song demos. I would get down, I'm from the Pacific Northwest. So I would get down there. I'd make these fabulous connections. And then I'd end up back home and they would just kind of shrivel on the vine. And it just, you know, doesn't, I guess it was not meant to be. I, I think I look back on that and go, it was almost became like a little idol in my life. Like, worship the, I must have a song, I must have a song, I will do anything, which kid shall I sell so I can sell a song? And it just got out of hand, you know, and I look back and go, and think, God's going, "Uh uh-uh, you are so not ready for this kind of success, you're not getting it, you know, and so it just, I wound up kind of fell backwards, stumbled into my writing career while I was busy trying to make it as a songwriter. And a lot of my friends actually moved to Nashville and I was just bereft because I wanted to go too. And I couldn't convince my husband that he should quit his job and we should just fly down <laughs> south with nothing and take a gamble on me becoming a famous songwriter. We had kids and he's like, I'm not sure this is a good idea. I was all for it. But anyway, you know, I, I think the bottom line, you wind up doing what you're supposed to be doing. And I still do the songwriting on the side and dabble. And now I finally years, millions of years later, got a cut on a CD and, and we did a really funny, if anybody ever gets a chance and wants to find it on YouTube, we did a, song, a music video to go with one of my earlier books. It was called Mary Xmas. And one of the characters in it, Jake was a musician songwriter and he wrote a song that got him in a lot of trouble with his ex mother-in-law. And so we wrote this funny song. And if you go on, on, YouTube and look up Merry Christmas Mama, you'll see this funny, um, this funny music video that we did with Santa Claus hauling mother-in-law off and I got to be the mother-in-law in it. So I had, I finally got my moment of stardom. <laughs> anyway, it was very fun. And so that was, that was kind of my, of course, my dream. I had a singing telegram company, played in bands. I did all kinds of music-y stuff, but the writing was always there. And when I sold my first book back when the pterodactyls flew, my husband said, why don't you just you know, stick with this? Because actually you're making some money at this. He says, spending money, you're making some money. This is a good idea. Let's just go this direction. And, you know, so we did. And I, I'm very happy with how things have turned out. Although, I must say, in Nashville this coming spring, the Book Lovers Convention is going to be there, and little Sheila is going to be there with her boots on and and dancing and (laughs) the Wild Horse Saloon and Pebble and Songs. I love it. I love it. I have such mad respect for songwriters. Uh, Someone who can take, you know, three and a half minutes and do to me emotionally what uh, a writer does in 100,000 words uh, is is pure magic, and and you're right. It is so competitive, and and, oh, and there's yeah. so many people that are just geniuses at it that uh, I, I have such respect for the art. Oh yeah, songs just they just we think of all those special songs in our lives, and you have this is our song, and and some song you'll hear will take you back to your teen years or whatever. I mean, they just have a powerful emotional impact, you know. But again. On the other hand, I, in all fairness to my fellow writers, so do books. You know, I'm sure you, like me, have books that really impacted you, uh, characters that you know, lived on in your mind, and books that left you thinking afterward. And, you know, someday, uh, my goal is someday to write one of those kind of books. I don't think I'm there yet, but I want to get there. One of my all-time favorite books is uh, A Christmas Carol. I think it's one of the best books ever, ever ever written. The story is brilliant. And I thought someday I want to write an equivalent to the Christmas Carol because I just love that story. I love it. I love it. So what was, uh, tell us about that first book that you wrote and got published. What was it about that story uh, do you think made the difference? 
Well, you know, this is really funny. As I said, I stumbled into my writing career, complete bumbling girl that I was years and years ago. In fact, I've, I've been around since dust, crashed, crashed my career twice. Uh, this first one, I started out writing Regency romances, and I was a big fan of Georgette Hayer and Jane Austen and, you know, all those writers. And uh, I, I had a girlfriend who had gotten a couple of books published, and I remember I got this idea. I wanted to write a book about a lady thief who was kind of like a lady Robin Hood. And I thought, oh, this would be a fun book to write, you know, rob from my fellow rich people and give it to the orphans. And I thought, I think I'll tell Sharon about this book idea. And we were broke at the time, and I rethought that and went, wait a minute, we need money. I think I'll write this book. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I, I did. And um, that was actually my first book that got published. She, I wrote this thing, and she and I, there was a writer's guide or writer's digest it used to list all the different agents and stuff and we just kind of went in that and she said oh i've heard of this woman <laughs> so i sent her a query letter and that woman turned out to want the book and made my first sale and it was it was just this crazy thing that i stumbled into my very first ever book though in fact i thought someday i need to dig that out now that world war ii is so popular i wrote the story of my mother-in-law's life she had quite a soap opera crazy life and I'm, I'm just going to make us both rich and we we're going to be millionaires <laughs> oh dear the idealism of <laughs> beginners and youth <laughs> and of course it sounds like your first book doesn't always sell and and it didn't and i laugh because my mother is quite the lady and you don't put anything naughty in your books because and i don't dare now because she taught me and then so there was her <laughs> and then my mother-in-law was we should have more sex in it <laughs> so <laughs> Oh dear. So anyway, that book, that book never did, but um, the little Regency romance did. And that just kind of launched me, but I was a terrible researcher. I mean, I was always messing up something and I really think it was a blessing in disguise that that career kind of fizzled out. And I, I went in a little more contemporary uh, direction because at least you can talk to living people and say, did I get this right? You know, and so I am finding that a lot easier to, to research for a modern book than I did for doing historicals. Well, I think a lot of people now know you from uh, or, or for the the types of books that you write now, which are kind of these uh, – uh, a lot of them are centered around the holiday season, the Christmas season, uh, and they are contemporary romance, uh, friendship uh, – kind of deal with subjects like that what was it that drove you to uh, you know when when after doing regency romance and historical fiction what brought you to to this type of story well you know it took a lot of soul searching i had to kind of figure out who do i want to be when i grow up and many of my friends who are just way farther up the success ladder than i am knew very early on what they wanted to do and they didn't fumble bumble around and say let's try this let's try this they just kind of zeroed in on what their market was and who they were as a writer and it just took me a while to find myself and i think i just uh, it's hard to pin it down and say this is the exact thing that i thought that turned me this direction but i just think i must have instinctively known i need to write in the generation I live in. I need to write for people I know right now. And I, I think, I feel like that's, I found my niche that way. I feel like that's served me well. And I really like writing about things that we women deal with. And I, and one of my big goals from writing is I, I just want to be able to encourage women. I, I often will try and do something in a book. Years ago, I wrote a book called Small Change and it was dealing with money matters. I'd wanted to write a finance book and my agent kind of said, well, you know what? <laughs> you don't exactly have a platform. You're not a, you know, you, nobody knows you. Nobody knows how fabulous you are with money. <laughs> and so I thought, fine, I'll sneak it in a book. And so I kind of did that and, and put in some money tips and some things that I thought would, you know, encourage women as they were going through maybe some financial struggles. And so often that's kind of underlying in some of the books. I've had a couple of ones where women are dealing with cancer issues. It's something that I've dealt with, and I know what a hard journey that can be. So I like to write things that I think are going to be encouraging to women, and, and, and maybe they'll, you know, they'll get a good story out of the deal, but maybe they'll come away with a little bit of hope and a little bit of, I, gosh, maybe I can conquer this thing in my life. Well, that's, that's kind of the genius of uh, of the type of fiction that you write is because it is contemporary and it is very character based. You really can t uh, tackle different topics uh, because th that's what these characters are going through. It's a it's kind of a perfect vehicle for you to uh, stretch out a little bit and and not feel so pigeonholed maybe. 
that, you know, this is a going to be a, a holiday classic. You know, that this can be about so much more. That just happens to be the vehicle for this. Yeah, sometimes. And I have to admit this latest book I just kind of wrote more for fun, but I did want to call attention to the importance of uh, – Caring about those nonprofits and those charitable organizations, sometimes we only think about them at the holidays, and really there are needs all year round. And I, I, gosh, I would like to encourage people pick, you know, kind of pick a horse and ride it. Pick what you think is the most important thing that really needs help. The government cannot do it all. I mean, we'd like to just dump that all on, you know, Uncle Sam's shoulders and say, hey, you take care of everybody in need. But that doesn't really, that's just really not a viable solution. And I often think that if everybody pitched in and did their one little part in their one little corner of the world, every corner would be covered. And once upon a time, this was something that the church did. And I think that the church has kind of stumbled a little bit in that. And not that churches aren't trying, but I, but that used to be the whole social security system once upon a time. You know, we've gradually kind of eased out of that. And I understand that people have busy lives. You're working, you're trying to feed your family, and, and there's only so, there are only so many hours in the day. But I think um, if we can all dig into our pockets just a little bit, go without a couple lattes, and just find a cause that you like to give to, you know, on, on a, at least a semi-regular basis, it can make such a difference in the world. Well, along the way, uh, you've had a couple of your books that have uh, have turned into movies. That uh, and you know, there's a there's a huge swath of the audience that loves these Hallmark and Lifetime Christmas movies, and you know, so much so that that Hallmark was playing Christmas movies in July uh, this year, I think it was. And you know, there's just something oh. about those movies that that you know, it's just you know, guilty pleasure. You you turn it on the TV, and you can just kind of escape and into a happy place for a while. Uh, what was that feeling like to know that your books had had connected with an audience so much that they were going to uh, to be movies? Well, I'm going to tell you, that was just fun. You, know, you, you have certain times in your life and you look and go, that was really fun. And the movie thing was really fun. When we, they did uh, the movie of On Strike for Christmas, it all happened so fast we didn't get a chance to visit the set. But when they did the movie for The Nine Lives of Christmas, we were, were able to visit the set, and we even got, my husband and I got a little cameo appearance on it, which was so much fun. And i got to tell you, I was just coming off chemo at the time and did just gone through a chemo treatment i was in my little wig and exhausted and those poor people you know they make these movies they're there they are filming 10 12 hours a day this they're just it's a back-breaking exhausting thing and i still remember at one point i think we'd been there like eight hours and of course it does take a long time just to shoot a scene but uh, i finally told my husband you know they probably would like us to leave now he was having so much fun he goes oh they're fine finally i said we have to go and die in here but i'll tell you a really funny story about that so we 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 are in uh, there's a little restaurant scene with the a main character and we were the first couple seated in the restaurant and then we're kind of in the background and I know everybody knows that you know you think people are talking in the background and they're really just kind of moving their lips I mean, you feel really stupid moving your lip and not saying anything because you feel like you should be talking or whispering and I'll never forget this so we we kind of got tired of doing that so we started kind of whispering and making funny comments and we were just really enjoying ourselves until the guy with the boom mic came over and said would you two shut up we were picking up everything you're saying i was like oh, oh so i was pretty great. embarrassed i was like Ooh. and of course joking me like, do you know who i am and he'd go yeah i do and shut up but anyway it was it was really it was fun and everybody was just delightful on the set. The producer, Jim Head, is a doll. And um, I keep hoping we're going to get to work together again. So far, we haven't been able to, to make that movie magic happen. But I have fond hopes because I really want to have another red carpet party. We always have a big party when the movie comes out. And the girls all go to Goodwill and get evening gowns. And <laughs> So it's very fun. But anyway, I, you know, I tell myself, don't be greedy. You know, you just be thankful you got a couple movies. And it was a very special thing. Very, very fun. Love it, I love it. Um, so speaking of your, um, y- you talked about having chemotherapy. How did going through um, a health challenge like that? How did that affect your creativity? And uh, do you feel like that writing um, was a was a help during that time? Maybe a catharsis in some ways. Oh yes, I. I- I think it was. I, you know, I'm such a little hypochondriac squirrel. I was sure I was going to, like, be dying. So I had to finish this last book just in case. 
So there was that. But I also journaled throughout the time, and that wound up being a little memoir that I self-published. It was called Unexpected Journey. And, and I just, again, I thought, I want somebody to be able to hopefully benefit from this. I feel like I really grew spiritually during that time. I felt like I came away a little bit wiser. Uh, I need to reread that, actually, so I stay wise. <laughs> but I'm a little bit stronger. And, uh, it, and you know, you go through things like that. And I tell you what, hard things that you, that you either pull you together or they push you apart. And in the case of my husband and myself, it really pulled us together. He was my hero. He was just amazing in the whole process there for everything every step of the way watching over me and i i felt so blessed in that matter i had a a friend who was she'd also gone through cancer and she was a nurse at the cancer you know in the cancer area of the hospital uh and she said sometimes she would come when we would come in and they'd look kind of down and she'd be what's wrong and it would be well my my husband just couldn't take it and he left me I'm going, wow, really, at the worst time in your life, you know, and so these things happen, and so I just felt like I really, I just was in in a really good position to weather that well, and I'm very thankful that, you know, we got through it, and I've been able to to write more books, it's just really been a a cool thing, but yeah, for me, I, I, I just stayed focused, and just kept writing, you know, no matter what. And you, you have days where you just, all you can do is lay on the couch. But I tried to stay very healthy. And just for anybody who's listening who's going through this, my doctor said, you have to walk a mile a day. Every day you have to walk. And she said, and, and I remember, I think she either told me, I can't remember where I read a study that said that the women who do that get through this better than the women who just kind of lay around and don't keep moving. And like I said, there are usually were always a couple of days after chemo where it hit me where I remember I was at a girlfriend's house for a little luncheon and I'd been down there with a little blanket. I went to pull the blanket. I was so exhausted. I told my husband, I'm not coming home. I can't drive. I'd spend the night at my friend's house just for folding a blanket. So uh, a wimp that I am. So, you know, you have those hard times. But um, I, anybody going through this, I would just like to encourage them that, you know, you, you can come out stronger the other end. Well, I'm going to put a link in the show notes to Unexpected Journey, the memoir uh, that that came out of that. I think a lot of people will um, will connect with that for sure. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but let's talk about the new book. Christmas from the Heart is the brand new book. Um, tell us where this story came from. Well, you know, I wanted to write a <laughs> Oh, always chasing Dickens. I wanted to write a Scrooge story, a modern-day Scrooge story, and I just thought this would be a fun thing to do. And I also wanted to kind of make a little bit of an argument. You know, I hear we talked earlier about how important it is to help people in need, to give to those good causes. But sometimes we can get a little on our high horse and get a little judgmental and not realize that sometimes someone just isn't in a position to do that. And I thought it would be nice if I at least gave my businessman a bit of an, a, a bit of a reason for why he's being a Scrooge. And of course, you know, he, he comes to his senses by the end of the book. But I thought that would, it would be a good, a good thing to actually play devil's advocate a little bit and say, you know, businesses, we've, I've done a lot of work over the years with things I, we had a, in our town where we live, we had, I started a ladies night out. And so you're doing a lot of approaching businesses for things and businesses get hit up a lot. Everybody, and I get hit up a lot. People are, and not that I have a problem with that, but sometimes you can only do so much, you know, and businesses are always being asked, can you give free whatever? Could you do this? Could you do that? Well, sometimes they just can't. It's not in their budget and especially small businesses, you know, so I thought it might be a, not a bad idea to, to say, hey, this guy, you know, he's kind of rethinking things here. And then he rethinks things again. And I just, I had a fun time with him. I had a fun time torturing him and making him judge a fruitcake contest because he doesn't like fruitcake. I'm amazed how many, there are a lot of people who don't like fruitcake. I'm not that fond of it myself unless it's an apricot fruitcake. But uh, anyway, I thought that would be a fun thing to do. So I had a lot of fun with the book. I, I remember uh, watching Johnny Carson uh, as a kid and him making a joke about fruitcake and, and saying that there was there was only one fruitcake in the world and we were all just passing it around because nobody actually liked it. <laughs> That's funny. Mm, my goodness. Well, I must say that this does have this does have a recipe in it um, that's a very a very good one. I gotta say, chocolate fruitcake. You can't go wrong with chocolate anything. Oh no, absolutely not. Um, I love the idea that in this book that you you play devil's advocate and you let us see the the antagonist of the book in a different light. 
Um, and I, you know, as you're you're writing a lot of <clears throat> a lot of books with a similar theme, um, and and th- I think this is a perfect example of what I want to ask you. Um, but how do you how do you mix things up to to keep every story fresh and so that you as the writer get excited about writing, um, you know, uh, another book in the same genre uh, and and keep it alive and fresh? I think that can be a challenge. Sometimes you go, how many books can you write about Christmas? <laughs> right. You know, well, the, the, the same thing similar, happens. Are, well, the same thing I'm happens sorry, with the, I said the same thing can happen with a science fiction writer. You know, how many how many books can you write uh, about an alien invasion? You know, and it's it's not. Uh, I, I think every <laughs> everyone struggles with that. You know. Possibly, I, I, and and you just got to go. Well, how can I put a twist on an old tale? And and that's what I've done. Tried to do a lot. My one of the books that put me on the map for Christmas was on strike for Christmas. And there have been books written about strikes. There have been books written about Christmas, but there hadn't been those two things combined with all the women in town going on strike and putting the guys in charge. So for me, that made it something fresh and fun. And oh, I'll tell you a funny background story about that. My husband, Mister Wonderful, he, he's not totally perfect. Perfect, and he was being rather imperfect after a big Thanksgiving gathering with my family. I am the shrinking violet of my family, so you can imagine what the rest of them are like. Anyway, we were leaving Thanksgiving dinner, and I'm like, wasn't that fun? That was so fun. And he's kind of like, Rah. we have to do it all again at Christmas. And I'm like, what on earth? And he's going on and on, going, oh, it's the same, same stupid jokes. And ever somebody always sticks their finger in the whipped cream on somebody's pumpkin pie, and you guys are just so there. Uh, anyway, I got really irritated. I said, I am, I am putting you in a book. It's not going to be good. And so I actually did. I came up with this idea for this book, and my husband landed in this book and if you ever read it his nickname is Bob Humbug and and so he was in there and uh, it's pretty funny finally the book came out and he read this and he said am I that bad and of course that was my moment to really stick it to him yes you really really were bad and but of course I did and I said well it's just a fiction and so I I missed my opportunity to really stick it to him and then of course it got made into a movie and then he was really proud of himself because he said see huh because of me we got a movie so the the whole thing blew up on my face (laughs) that is so funny that is so funny um when you I would imagine that you have a fairly rabid fan base, and and I mean that in the in uh, in, in in the best way that um, people expect to have a new book from you every year, and they expect to, to you know have these these feel good feelings at the end, and you know Sheila's going to challenge me a little bit, but at the end I'm going to feel, uh, you know I, I'm going to feel better. I'm going to have learned something about the world around me. Um, have you ever had a situation where maybe you pushed the limits and the edges of your writing a little bit and got pushback from readers? Oh, dear, you would have to ask that, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, I did, I must say, so we have talked about movies. The Nine Lives of Christmas was a very cute movie, definitely different than the book. And the book kind of had had the cat had a viewpoint. <laughs> I guess that's a little hard to do in a movie. But anyway, my fireman, I wanted him to be manly. And I, my fireman had held, turned out, I didn't realize what a potty mouth I was giving him. I, <laughs> I read that myself later. I thought, oh, my gosh, my mother's going to haunt me for this. Anyway, I did... I did get a very not very happy letter from a lady. She had watched the movie, thought the movie, so folks listening, just be prepared. This would be a PG-13 book. Anyway, she had watched the movie, thought it was just wonderful, got the book, and was horrified because I had some bad words in there and I had sexual innuendo. I mean, I write Fifty Shades of White. Nobody loses their clothes in my books. They just don't. You know, I'm not going in the bedroom with you guys. You're on your own. But she was just very angry at me with all these things I'd done. And the closing thing, she said, I'm keeping the cover because I love the picture of the cat, but I'm throwing the book away. (laughs) And it was like, ow. So I was pretty verbally spanked over that. And you know what, though? That was a good reminder that, you know, Sheila, you write PG. Let's just remember Fifty Shades of White. Let's just start, try, and, try and, you know, and once in a while, I mean, really, realistically, most of us, if we hit our hand with a hammer, we do not say shucky darn. And so I'd like to at least be a little bit realistic. But, you know, there's a line I try not to cross because, you know, I, there's there's no point in offending people. And I think you can usually get your message across without irritating your readers. And I definitely irritated that lady. It was... <laughs> So it was a bit of a learning experience. I thought, OK, 
okay, I don't think I'm going to do this again. I'm going to be a little wiser in the future. And my son was a, went through a phase. He's way too busy now in his executive world that he wanted to be a writer also. And, and I remember he had written some things, and I, and I, I, I told him, I take it to heart for myself. I said, once it's in print, it is there. You can't take it back. It's out there in the world. And I try to remind myself when I'm doing something, you know, because it's very easy as a writer when you're sitting all by yourself in your little room, unsupervised, <laughs> to just go, wah, and go in all kinds of directions. And I will try and kind of look at something and say, okay, is this the best way I could have said this? You know, it was there, and, you know, someone I'm going, going to needlessly offend. You know, as a writer, you're probably going to offend somebody. You cannot please everyone. You just can't. You have to be true to yourself and to your art and to what you feel you're you're supposed to write. But on the other hand, I think it's really important to always take a second look and say, you know, a year from now, five years from now, am I going to read this and be proud of it? Or am I going to be slinking around in embarrassment? So I try to kind of do that test on a book before I put it out there. Well, and it's always a great exercise for a writer to find a different way to say something. Yes, be true to, to the reality of characters. Um, but everyone appreciates when when someone finds a, a clever new way to uh, express an emotion and I don't think there's anything wrong with with trying that for sure for sure and I mean some words are just I, I think have gotten very overused in our culture and and we just don't we just don't need to go down the road at least yeah. I guess I personally don't need to go down that road and so I just try to find different roads yeah well they and they lose their impact when you just sprinkle them you know all over the book you know if if you have to use one use it sparingly so that it has impact like it's supposed to yeah 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 i agree absolutely well, the new book is called Christmas from the Heart. Sheila, I, I love what you're doing. Um, I, I'm a big fan, and we're going to send everyone to pick up their copy of the new book. We'll also put a link in there to the memoir, Unexpected Journey. Um, if people are just learning about you, I know that you have a fantastic website with lots and lots of stuff on it. Um, where can they find you online? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, if you look... Uh, type in Sheila Roberts and Sheila's Place.com. You'll find me. We've got lots of fun recipes up there. There's always a contest going on. I think we've got one going on right now. And uh, I'm always welcome visitors to Sheila's Place. Excellent. We'll put a link to it in the show notes as well. Uh, Sheila, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed visiting with you. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. The year was 1834. The month was December. I was 14. Irving's tale was by then well known. The characters of Brom Bones and the beauteous Katrina were widely understood in town to refer to my parents. Rumors persisted. I heard the name of Headless Horseman whispered. My father dismissed all these tales, calling them malicious. Yet more than once I saw him and my mother scanning Agatha's face across the supper table, finding only a secret smile and a look of defiance. I found the rumors fascinating. I followed Agatha like a pup, waiting for her to cast some magic spell. And one day she did. The household servants had set a fire in the hearth for her comfort, and she sat close to it, counting out small gold coins upon a lap board. I hid in the shadows, hoping she might drop a coin and I could retrieve it for myself. One of her servants, a West Indian girl, carried a snowy log into the room and set it on the fire. It began to hiss and pop. The snow melted and the fire sputtered out. Agatha cursed as I had never heard her do before. She stood, spilling all the gold, and slapped the idiot girl across the face. The girl ran, and my grandmother muttered to herself, searching for match and tong to no avail. When she was not looking, I crept forward and took for myself one of the gold pieces. Then something remarkable occurred. My grandmother sighed, knelt before the fireplace, reached for the logs, and her right hand caught a fire. Flame blossomed and coiled about her wrist. I gasped and cried out, Shh! Don't be afraid, my Dylan. Your hand! She raised her palm. Flame sat cupped in it, casting the shadow of her fingers upon the ceiling and walls. Lock the door, she said. I obeyed. 
She pointed to the floor, and I sat, waiting breathlessly. This is the Van Brunt gift. It will be your gift as well, soon, and your children's forever afterwards. Why does it not burn you? I asked. Why should it? Do I deserve to be burned? No. Then I am safe from the fire. Do you deserve to be burned, my Dylan? I shook my head. Show me. I reached for the flame and took it. I pulled back at once, crying out with pain, wagging my fingertips. The fire caught my sleeve. I could not rid myself of it, as if I clutched burning tar. The pain intensified. The blisters broke, and a rivulet of lymph ran down my arm. Your conscience knows, Dylan. You deserved to be burned. Say it. I deserved to be burned, said I. Again! I deserved to be burned! She turned her palm. The gold piece. I nodded and brought the stolen coin from my pocket. She took it and raised it to the light. You cannot wield the flame with guilt in your heart, son. Try, and it will devour you. Do you understand? I nodded. A Van Brunt should not be so weak. I'm sorry I took the gold, Grandmother. I'm sorry I was bad. Don't be ashamed of me. She frowned and laid the gold coin on her lapboard. She shook her head sadly. I'm not ashamed that you took the gold. I'm ashamed that you felt the guilt.